All right, amen. Let's be praying for our youth as they go and equip for battle, amen? Because that's what they're doing. They're getting equipped for battle. If you would, go and take your Bibles and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2, and we are going to read uh, this chapter in its entirety. There's some very interesting things in this chapter, uh, primarily about prayer, worship, and the roles of men and women. First Timothy chapter 2, and this is what Paul wrote to his precious child of the faith, Timothy. Therefore, I exhort you first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks may be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all goodness, excuse me, in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, fell into transgression. Nevertheless, we will be saved in childbearing if we continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. Would you pray with me? Father, we love your word and we love the Apostle Paul and all the trials he went through, Father, that we may have a better understanding of what worship looked like then, what church life looked like in Father, so that we can also apply God's Word to our hearts and minds here today. And Father, I pray that you'd move me aside. Let the very Spirit of Jesus work and minister every heart and mind. God, that we may not only enjoy God's Word tonight, but Father, that we would allow God's Word to have power over our hearts and minds to shape us into more and more your image. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. Amen and amen. So we have Paul, he writes on prayer, worship, and the roles of men and women, which some of this is hot-button topic here in some churches, especially regarding the roles of women and teaching. Uh, and, and bear in mind, I, I'm not really big on controversial subjects, but I am very big on the Word of God and what it says, and for us to understand what God's Word means, because I believe that God's Word is inerrant. I believe that God's Word is timeless. That means that we can Take God's Word and apply it. It doesn't matter when you read it, where you read it. It's still applicable in life. And so we're going to figure out what Paul meant as he wrote this and penned this to Timothy. Very interesting subjects here. But before we get too far, we must understand that Paul is writing to Timothy as a pastor to a pastor, in a sense. Giving Timothy wisdom to, to lead and guide a church. And he also mentions these two men that we must pay attention to before we really look into chapter 2. And that is these two guys named Hymenaeus and Alexander, which we see in verse 20 of chapter 1. Now I'm just going to read a little bit before that, where it says in verse 18 of chapter 1, it says, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Whew, whoa, man. There are some heavy words there. One, we, we must understand 
Paul is commissioning Timothy, and he says to fight the what? The good fight. Is there such thing as a good fight? Right? But Paul calls it fight the good fight, meaning this. You give your all in this. There's no halfway in this. You give everything you have in this fight, Timothy. Because this fight that we are in, it's not over things that can be broken and things that can be taken on the earth. Our fight is about the very immortal soul of those that we love and those who we don't even know. Amen? This is the fight we are all engaged in. So, Christians, are you engaged in spiritual warfare? Yes or no? Man, whether you want to believe it or not, you are engaged in warfare right now. You're in this battle. We're all in this battle, and we must fight the good fight. And Paul gives us clear instructions on how to fight that good fight. How many of you want to fight a good fight, amen, for the Lord Jesus? Some of us just want to fight sometimes. Amen. Amen. But we must fight the good fight so that God may be honored and glorified. Because Paul brings up these two individuals who rejected the faith. And so they were what? Shipwrecked. There have been many Christians who have suffered shipwreck. And I believe for the very same reasons that possibly these two men did. And I think we can recount just that story of Peter when he stepped out of the boat and began to walk towards Jesus. And as, as most pastors would preach, Peter, his eyes and his heart was no longer set on who? Jesus. So Christians, I know this might just sound so simple, but I believe that if we would just keep our hearts and our eyes where they need to be, we can fight a good fight. Amen? If we just keep our eyes and our hearts where they so desperately need to be, that we will fight a good fight. Because listen, we have an enemy who's ready to fight with us. We have an enemy that is ready to fight against us. We have an enemy that might even give you a flat tire on a Sunday. Amen? Nobody wants one of those. You know, the enemy might lead that special someone in your life, right? You know, we've heard this expression that God opens what? Doors. So does the devil. The devil wants you to think that God opened a door sometimes so you can walk right into his trap. So you well, Pastor Chris, how do we know what door to walk into? If we are in prayer and in relationship to God the Father, He is going to speak to you daily. His Holy Spirit is going to speak to you daily. Matter of fact, when you read the Word, your very desires should take on the form and shape of God's desires. And you're going to be able to look at what is false and what is truth. Amen? We must run everything through prayer and through Scripture. If we do not, we're just setting ourselves up for failure and for being shipwrecked. Paul desired Timothy to fight the good fight. And not only this, but Paul says he delivered Hymenaeus and Alexander over to whom? Satan. I mean, that's so harsh, Paul. Why would you do that? As it says in 1 Corinthians, when he was dealing with a man who started uh, basically living with his mother, a stepmother, They had to basically, essentially, cast him out of the church. Give his flesh over to the world so that his soul might be, what? Saved. Seems extreme. Paul was very extreme about his faith. Because these two men had rejected Jesus and had rejected the faith. And Paul could no longer pursue these men. He had to take his hands off and give who control? God. Amen. Do you know how hard it is for us to let go sometimes and let God take control? Listen, we're going to kill ourselves if we think that we can control anything. You're going to drive yourself crazy if you think for one second that you're in control of anything that's going on. God is in control. He is a sovereign God 
God knows what's going to happen before we even say it or do it. God knows. And God is always there for us. You know what He's waiting on us to do? He's waiting on us to say, okay, God, now, what would you like me to do now? Maybe if we'd ask Him permission first, or maybe if we just talk to Him about things, instead of saying, you know what, God, I'm going to do this. Or we just do it and ask God, oh, He'll forgive me later. That's not fighting the good fight. Fighting the good fight is going all the way for Jesus. Arming yourself with the Word and the Spirit. And so, Paul sets up this Uh, idea for Christian worship and prayer for Timothy. After he says these few words about these two men who rejected the faith, then Paul says, therefore, in verse 1 of chapter 2, therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks may be made for who? All men. Everyone. For kings and all who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Amen. So who are we to pray for? Everybody. For all men. Every, even the people you don't like, you got to pray for them. Matter of fact, I would caution you to pray for those the most. Pray for them. And don't pray like, God, may they fall down the steps or anything like that. Don't pray like that, right? Don't pray bad things for them. You pray wonderful things. Say, God, may they give you glory and turn their lives over to you. Amen? Amen. You pray for their well-being, not for their harm. Amen? Because you know what? God wants to give every person a future and a good hope. Amen? And so we should be in alignment with God. We should pray for our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. Amen? I think Jesus said that, right? Amen? Praise the Lord, right? We should pray for those whom we have difficult times with. We pray for all men. We pray for those who are in high authority. Amen? Pray for your president. Some of you might say, Lord, uh, pre- uh, Pastor, you're asking a lot there. You know? You know what I'm saying? Especially when we get into politics. Because some people have really different views, unbiblical views. You say, Pastor Christian, we pray for those who have unbiblical views. Yes, pray for them. Pray that God would get in their lives. Pray that God would change them. Pray that the Holy Spirit would awaken their hearts to faith. Yes, we pray for them. The only way we're ever going to change our country is if God's people would pray and seek God's face and ask God, Lord, we depend upon You. We want change. Because only God can give true change. Only God can. And we find out in Scriptures that God raises up leaders and tears them down. Some people think that they place some others in authority. But that is false. God is in what? Control. He's in control. And do you know what kind of comfort that you as a person can have once you figure out that God is in control? You know what kind of peace that you can have? I, I'm talking about a joy and a peace that is not of this world. Amen. That is eternal and joyful because you know that God has everything under control. And all we have to do is just obey and listen and love and enjoy the life that God has given us and depend upon Him for everything. And just don't worry. Some of you worry so much. you got little worry lines here and And sometimes our prayers just become about our worries. When our prayers should in fact not be about our worries, but also about those around us. That we would pray for all men. That we would pray for those who are in high authority. That we would pray for those in which we have problems with. That You know, Jesus prayed for you. Amen. Amen? We must be a people of prayer. And so to fight the good fight, we must be a people of prayer. One of my pastor friends, he was trying to get to a pastor's meeting. And listen, this is a key position for him because he was providing the food. All right? 
He's outside of Walmart and he locks himself out of his vehicle. And he calls me. And I say, well, brother, I'm going to pray for you. But we need to get that food here. So he's like, you want me to come pick you up? And so as we were talking about that, he said, well, well pastor, let, let, just hold on. I'm going to see if I can't get someone who's closer. And so he hangs up. A few minutes later, he calls me back. He says, pastor, you won't believe this. The door is just unlocked. They just unlocked. And we started praising the Lord and we, we couldn't understand it. And then you know how some of those people who have like, oh, well, the reason why it unlocked is because someone had a keychain and probably like yours. And we we're like, no, stop that. It was God. Just give him glory. Just give God glory for a second. You know, don't try to explain it. Give him glory. Because my brother was sitting there with fried chicken and we wanted that fried chicken. And he was like, Lord, <laughs> right? He's just Lord. And it just popped open. The locks. Couldn't understand it. He, he didn't have OnStar. He had Jesus. Amen. Amen. We need to be a people of prayer. He prayed. And he, he gives God glory in that. And I can guarantee you, each of us, we can share even more trying times of prayer and how God has led us through trying times with prayer. We must be a people of prayer. But Paul further talks about this subject in verse 3. He says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of our God and Savior, who desires all men to be saved, to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave Himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I am appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and in truth. When we pray, Paul says pray for everybody, pray for your leaders, but he says pray that they would all come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Church, this is the biggest mindset that every church needs to change. We need to pray for the lost. We need to pray for the perishing and the dying of this world. We need to pray for them. We need to pray for those who do not have the knowledge of Jesus. We need to pray for those who have never stepped into the, the, the doors of a church. We need to pray for those who hate God. We need to pray for those who say, I'm an atheist. We need to pray for those who says, I'm a Buddhist. We need to pray for those who are not of Jesus Christ. We need to pray for them. And if you see a church who prays for the lost, you will see people get saved. You will see people come to know Jesus Christ because listen, our Bible teaches us that God hears the faithful prayers of His people. Amen? Amen? And so we must be a people of prayer and we must pray that people come to know this beautiful Jesus Christ who is that mediator between God and man. I remember this guy named Job. Whenever I think I've had a bad day, nope. Just think about Job. Amen? Job had it rough. And then he had three friends who were such encouragers. They, they came to encourage Job and was like, well, Job, you just need to repent and move on because you did something wrong. And Job's like, I did not sin. And they kept on saying, no, you must have because you're in a really bad spot here. And you know what Job said in the middle of that section, the beautiful poetry there? He says, I wish but I had a mediator or umpire between me and God. Amen. He prayed that if he only knew what the future held. Because we have such a mediator, such a high priest who knows what we go through and can identify with us. You see, Jesus, He walked in our shoes. Amen. Amen. He walked on this earth yes, so God could identify with His people. You can't tell me that our God doesn't understand us because Jesus felt every bit that we felt. And He loved us that much. We have a mediator. And so to honor God and to worship Him, we must pray that someone will receive that mediator too. We must pray for them. Their souls hang in the balance. To fight the good fight, we must be a people of prayer and we must pray for the lost. Then Paul gets specifics here. 
he talks about the, men, the role of men and women here. He says in verse 8, A desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. We'll stop right there. The men get one verse here, right? It looks like you guys get off easy in this passage, but uh, we'll look about that later, okay? But it says that all men should pray. Amen? With what? Hands lifted high. You know, in that culture in that day, it was very suitable for a man when he prayed out loud to lift his hands up. You could probably walk during those days, you could walk to the temple. Matter of fact, you could probably watch a video or two, look at the Wailing Wall, which is the last bit of the Jerusalem temple left. Now we just have a mosque there, but just this last bit is called the Wailing Wall. And Jews come there to worship God in remembrance of the temple that they once had. And you will still see some faithful Jews lift up their hands like so. What does this symbolize? Surrender. Yes, Lord. We just surrender. We just let go. We just give God what He deserves. And that is glory and praise. That God wishes that Paul says, good fighting, good worship. These men must worship God and surrender. Surrender your hearts. Our world is burning because we do not have spiritual men. Our America is dying because we don't have any spiritual leaders, men of God, who will stand up and fight the good fight. Men of God who will worship in public and who are not ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. They just love Jesus with everything they have. Completely unashamed. And they're fighting the good fight. But we need more men like that. He said, Pastor Chris, how can we get more men like this? Jesus said, go and make what? Disciples. You're never going to see men like that unless churches are making disciples and teaching young men to raise their hands in worship without wrath, without doubting, but just giving God surrender. And that's what us men need to do. Now look at, and let's see what you ladies need to do. Oh, Pastor Chris, you're going to get in trouble tonight. I'm going out the back. But this is what Paul writes to Timothy regarding church worship. He says, in like manner also, meaning women should pray as such, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety, or in some translation, with, with decency, and moderation, or in some places it may say good sense, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with what? Good works. And so listen, we live in a culture that is completely sexualized. We do. It's everywhere. And so media and most outlets place beauty at a certain way. Matter of fact, if you go to any kind of clothing store, women, if you're honest, it's hard to buy anything that is modest. Amen. Amen. And I got two daughters, guys. I'm going to have a problem with this, you know? My, my poor kids are going to wear potato sacks, you know? <laughs> my poor kids, you know? But we, we do live in a culture that is lacking in modesty. We do. And what Paul is stressing here, and in that culture, you must understand, in that culture, women who wore some of these things that he's talking about, pearls, gold, costly clothing, doing your hairs in a certain way, that many in that day would have been what some people would have called women of the night Amen. or good time girls. You know, what Paul is basically saying is this, that the women of the church must dress in a manner that is worthy of the Lord. It's a double-edged sword, though. You ladies, Paul's wanting the ladies to dress in which they would not tempt a man. But you know what? Not all the responsibility lies on you. Because us men, what do we need to do? Watch our eyes, amen? Amen. We need to watch our eyes and watch our hearts. We need to 
guard our hearts. And if we both do our parts, amen, well, then you have a beautiful thing going on. Paul is saying that your beauty should come from where? Really, the inside. Your good works. Paul, in all of his letters, always stressed such good works that your fruit would tell exactly who you are and that you women of valor and you women of beauty, may that beauty come from the inside of, of God's beauty inside of you. And do not not get lost in the fact that you have to look a certain way or to be a certain way to be found beautiful. Matter of fact, that us men, you know, when Adam was first guy on the world, first guy, and God said it's not good that he's alone, right? And he takes that rib from Adam, which isn't from his foot, so that man could tread upon woman, amen? He didn't take it from the head so that woman could rule over man, right? He took it from the rib, which is closest to where? The heart, signifying partnership. There's partnership here. And so he gives Adam Eve. God did not line up several different ladies and say, Adam, pick your favorite one. He didn't do that. God gave Eve to Adam specifically. And so Adam's idea of beauty was Eve. That was his idea of beauty. That was what he found as beautiful. And so when he saw Eve for the first time, I bet he's like, whoa, man. And so you all are called woman. Amen. Right? He's probably blown away. You say, Pastor Chris, what are you saying? That us men, our idea of beauty should be our wife. The one that God gave us. Don't be silly and think you picked your wife. God gave you to her. God's in control. She should be our idea of beauty. And so you know where our eyes should be? On Our Lady. Amen? I told you guys we're not going to get off easy tonight. No, we're not. Going on in verse 11, Let a woman learn in silence and with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, holiness, and with self-control. And so this is, a, a, this is that topic here of women being able to serve and teach in church uh, and do things in the church. And we must really look at what Paul, the context in which Paul is talking about, because right after this chapter, he goes into the list of what? An overseer. He's talking as a pastor to another pastor, and he's talking in the form of open worship. And if we look at the family structure, as Paul said, God made who first? Adam, and then Eve. That Adam signifying he would be a spiritual leader and he would guide his family. And so like sign the church. The church is a family. And so God would raise up a man to spiritually lead the church. As it says that an overseer should be the man of what? One wife. Amen. It says that in the next chapter. And so when we look at that, the idea of worship should be that a man would lead the church. And men would pick up and lead in the church. But do you know what we find in our culture is no male leadership. We don't. Matter of fact, most churches today, most of the leadership and the guidance and the pressing of the good gospel that we have comes from holy women who love the Lord. You know what I say to that? If God calls a man and he says no, God can call a woman up and she'll lead. In 2012, Lifeway, there's a magazine that came out and uh, it it featured the top 10 female pastors in America. You know what Lifeway did? Took all the magazines off the shelf. They, They took all of them down. Because in, in our denomination, some other denomination, they do not recognize the ordination of 
women pastors. They, they just look at that because we go back to this verse that if we look at a spiritually mature church, that we would have men that would lead and rise up and lead their congregations. Hot button subject. Amen? You know what is going to happen? Jesus is going to come back. And there will be people who will go to hell. And then there will be people who will be redeemed. Now I'm going to tell you this very honestly. Do you think Jesus would be more glorified if men didn't do anything? And so, okay, men's not going to do anything, so women won't do anything either, and people go to hell. No? I had a guy once tell me, who was thinking about coming here, and we were talking about uh, him joining the church, and he's like, well, pastor, the only thing I have a problem with is you have a lot of women leading here. And I was like, well, yes, sir, we do. And he's like, well, don't you think you should just wait until a man will, will pick up in that role? And I said, well, well, brother, what if I have nobody who would want to lead it? He's like, well, I guess you just don't need that ministry. I was like, man, uh, that's not how we roll here. Because you know what I want? Someone who desires to serve God Amen. and to see souls saved. Amen. That's what I desire. Paul is giving what he would say is the personified perfection of the church here. That you would have spiritually gifted men and women working together in a partnership and the men would be the leaders that they were always meant to be. And the women could be the helpmates they were always meant to be. That's what Paul's talking about here. You see, we get our roles confused. You see, Adam, he had one job, people. And that was to take care of Eve in the garden. That's it. It was his one job. And as it says here, and Paul clearly states... The reason why women cannot lead is because it's not their role. It says in verse 14, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. We always like to blame those ladies. We know it's all you women's fault. Right? <laughs> Watch out, brother. She'll get a hold of you. But I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this. Eve was fooled. She was fooled. She transgressed. She did not know what she really was doing. But do you know who knew what was happening? Adam knew what was happening. And he said nothing. He did nothing. Adam, the first man on the earth, he did what every one of us men are guilty of. We did not do what we were supposed to do. It's not what we do sometimes. It's what we fail to do. It's what we fail to say. We fail to lead. And God needs men who are willing to lead Amen. and to spiritually lead their homes. God needs the men of America to rise up and be spiritual, Jesus-loving men if we're ever going to see a change. We need this to fight the good fight. Amen? But what do we do first? We pray. Amen. Amen. We pray in such a way that we lift our hands. Amen. We just surrender. And we just trust God. Would you trust God with me now? Would you please stand as we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, forgive us, Lord. Because we each have a role to play as men and women. We each have a role to play as a part of the body of Christ here. That we may be formed and shaped and fitted together in beauty and in love. Father, that we may see Jesus lifted on high, that He may draw all men to Himself. God, that we would be a part of a movement, of a revival. Lord, that we would see Christianity restored here in America. God, that not a single man would get glory for it, but 
Lord, that you would get all glory and praise. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Help us, Father, to fight the good fight. Amen.